95, January, Prosecutor Christopher Darden set the tone in his opening statement in the O.J. Simpson murder trial. He says, everyone knows about O.J. the athlete and O.J. the celebrity, and by now, most of us know far more about his personal life than we care to know. Mr. Darden was not talking to the media, but he was talking to the 12 men and women who would render a verdict in what was known as the trial of the century. He must convince them that O.J. Simpson was guilty of a ghastly and heinous murder. Before Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman were brutally murdered, O.J. Simpson was one of the most popular athletes in America. He belonged in the upper echelon reserved only for the superstars, for people like Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Arnold Palmer, and Mickey Mantle. These are men who have become symbols for an entire generation of fans who grew up knowing them, watching them, and yes, even even loving them. Now, these men are not perfect. They have their flaws, but it's hard for us to imagine any of them, any of them committing murder. They are heroes. They are superstars and American idols. And it's easy to turn our faces away from reality that is sometimes hard to face the truth. Now, the prosecution needed a way to convince those 12 jurors that one of the great American icons was actually capable of committing a horrific deed, a bloody double murder. Now, Mr. Darwin Darden's uh, argument was simply stated. This is what he said. It is not the actor who is on trial here today, ladies and gentlemen. It is not that public face. It is his other face. The face we never see running through airports and driving rental cars. The face that never appears in the movies or on talk shows. It is, Mr. Darden said, the face he wore behind the walls of his Brentwood home. It is the face that none of us saw. Now, we don't know if Mr. Darden's words are true. But we do know this much. There is such a thing as having the other face. We know it's true because all of us have another face. Another face. There is within the human heart an enormous capacity for evil. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? It is possible that a man who seems to be friendly, positive, upbeat, and genuinely good-hearted could commit a cold-blooded murder. And that was the whole case against O.J. Simpson, that in a moment of violent rage, he attacked his ex-wife and her friend, brutally murdering both of them. That was the contention of the prosecutor. And that's what he wanted to convince the jury. Could a man, or in fact a woman, do such a thing? Well, the answer is yes. Because in a moment of anger, all of us and any of us are capable of horrific deeds that we would not commit otherwise. We might not think of murder. We may think that we would never do it. But in a fit of rage and anger, the reality is that we might do just about anything. And so my sermon this morning is not about O.J. Simpson. It's about us. It's about you. It's about me. He's just the example of an eternal truth. And the sermon is really about 
you and me and about what uncontrolled anger can do to us. In Genesis chapter 4, Adam and Eve had tragically just fallen into sin. In chapter, in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, Eve gave birth to two sons, Cain and Abel. And both men brought offerings to the Lord. However, Abel's offering was accepted by God and Cain's was not, which caused Cain to become extremely angry. And the Bible tells us that the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. And it desires to have you. But you must overrule it. Now, why was Abel's offering accepted and Cain's rejected? We don't know. I don't know. Was Cain angry at God or was he angry at his younger brother? I don't know. We don't know. But what do we do with this? What we know is that Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and he killed him. Struck him dead. Now in the ancient world, warriors were the greatest heroes of the day. They were the superstars of Israel. When men came back from battle, the women wrote songs about them. And in, in their honor, they wrote a little ditty that made King Saul so angry that when he realized that David had become more popular, he wanted to kill him. The little ditty went something like this. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And when Saul heard that, we are told that his anger burned within him. Jealousy drove him to attempt to murder David as envy ate away at his insides. Now, folks, anger is a very powerful emotion. It's a very powerful emotion that can be used for good or for evil. Anger is one of the attributes of, of God. Remember when Jesus turned over the table of the money changers in the temple in Matthew 21? Did you know that the Bible speaks over a hundred times of the anger of the Lord? A hundred times. The anger of the Lord. And we know that God never sins, yet the Bible repeatedly speaks of his anger towards sin and disobedience. There is a time for anger. There is a time for righteous indignation. We should be incensed when we see people hurting other people. It should bother us when we watch the wholesale slaughter of the innocent. When we see children being lured into drugs and prostitution and accosted by predators, this should make us mad. It should. If we sit by, idly by without caring enough to do something, then we need to check our inside to see if there's not something wrong with us. Anger can be a very useful and even Christian emotion. But we have to be careful with it. Not to let it cross over the line. Now, what line, you say? What line are you talking about? Well, the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. What that's saying is, you're going to get angry at times. God gets angry. Jesus got angry. But don't let it cross over. Be careful of that. Understand where that line is. And anger is one thing, but when we cross over the line, that's quite another thing. Add to it, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And it whole, adds a whole new dimension to what the Lord's telling us here. Some say, well, what that means is don't go to bed angry. Okay, that, that's sounded advice, but I think it's much, much bigger than that. It means deal with it. 
It means talk it out. It means pray it out. It means walk it out. But don't try to sleep it out. Don't try to tuck it away. Don't try to bury it because you know what? It never goes away. It never goes away. It always sprouts up in a root of bitterness. So what happens What happens when you don't deal with anger? Well, well, it settles in your heart. It settles in your heart. It hardens like concrete. It distorts your personality. It squeezes out the joy. And it oozes that smelly black gunk of unhappiness into virtually every part of your life. That's why the very next verse in Ephesians offers this warning. Do not give the devil a foothold. In your anger, do not sin. It doesn't say you might not sin. It says do not sin. Why? Because you're going to give the devil a foothold. Now, it's clear. I looked it up in the Greek, and it says it. It's absolute. Don't let that sleazy serpent get a beachhead on the shores of your soul so he can drive to the Berlin of your heart. Rock climbers understand this verse. In order to get up the side of a mountain, you've got to get a firm foothold on that cliff. And that's what Satan wants to do in your life. He wants to use your anger, even your legitimate anger, to get a foothold in your heart. He wants to do what he did to Cain and what he did to Saul in you. That's what he wants to do. Now, if you read 1 Samuel chapters 10 through 26, you'll discover that Saul was a gifted man. He was tall. He was handsome. He was a natural leader of men. He was skillful in battle. He was chosen by God to be the very, very first king of Israel. And in many ways, he had all the natural attributes for success, plus he had the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. Yet, we remember him as a failure because of the way his life ended. Now, there were many contributing factors, but in the end, his anger destroyed his life. After it became clear that David would replace him as king, Saul's heart was so blinded by rage that he could think of only one thing, and that was killing David. And so for 20 years, he hunted David. And the Lord protected David, but Saul was unrelenting. And finally, after falling into the abyss of darkness and witchcraft and rebellion, Saul the handsome, gifted king, and as well as his sons, were tragically killed by the Philistines. It says that they cut off his head, they put his armor in a pagan temple, and fastened his headless corpse to the wall of Beth Shan. It was a humiliating and tragic end for a man who had been a hero a superstar, an Israelite idol. And all because he couldn't get a handle on his anger. There's another man in the Bible who had every right to be angry at the way he was treated. He was a good man, a teacher of God's law, a man who helped those in need and got angry when only he saw the injustice that was taking place in the world. He never had a great education. He never held a public office. He never wrote a book. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. His own family thought he was a bit strange. They never really understood why he did what he did or why he said what he said. And when he started his ministry, the powers that be at first found him a nuisance and later a threat. And they sent their best people to try to trip him up on technicalities, but it never worked. He was too smart to fall for their slick questions. And each time they tried to trip him up, they tripped over their own foolishness, which made them even madder. 
eventually, they decided that he had to be put away with. He had to be killed. But because he was popular with the common people, they couldn't arrest him haphazardly. They had to find a reason. They had to find a plausible excuse. Something, something that would would cover up for their dirty deeds. And so as he entered the capital city on a donkey while multitudes lined the streets, they plotted and they, they schemed. And as the crowds cried Hosanna, they looked for ways to lure him into their trap. And they found a man among his followers, his treasurer no less, who was willing to sell him out in exchange for a handful of money. The deal was struck, the time was set, the plan was made. It all went like clockwork, and the good man was arrested. Five times he was tried before four different judges. The charges weren't really clear, but it was something about blasphemy or some reason for treason or something like that. At one hearing, the witnesses openly contradicted one another, but it didn't matter. You see, when anger turns to a fever pitch, all common sense and civility and decency goes out the window and is replaced with rage and wrath and fury. And so they beat him, they ridiculed him, they spat, mocked, humiliated, and tortured him until his flesh hung like ribbons from his body. He was beaten until he was barely, barely conscious. And they stripped him naked, they condemned him to die, and they forced him to carry his own instrument of death. And outside the city walls near a limestone quarry with the strange face of a skull outlined in the side of a cliff, this good man was put to death by crucifixion, which is one of the most horrendous and heinous methods of death ever contrived by the sons of Adam. The Bible says that the passers-by stood when they saw him. Then they joined the jeering crowd gone mad with their bloodlust. And the scene, in all its horror, gave proof that sin had fully and relentlessly permeated every single cell and every fiber and hair of Adam's race. He didn't say much that day, only about seven or eight sentences, but oh, what words they were, what power, what truth he spoke. When his chest heaving and the sun beating down on his bloody brow and his feet dripping blood from the nail-pierced holes, he could hear their laughter, he could hear their jeers. And as he closed his eyes, as if in prayer, he uttered words that are inconceivable to human hearts. They're inconceivable. Forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgive them. But they were guilty of this heinous atrocity. Forgive them. But he was innocent, and they knew it. Forgive them. But they had twisted the truth. They had made up lies. They had shattered his name. They had bribed his treasurer. They had rigged the trial and guaranteed his death. It was murder, pure and simple. They meant to kill him, and they did. What did he say? Father, forgive them anyway. Forgive them. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that Jesus said those words. Because it shows us that forgiveness is always possible. If Jesus could forgive them, then anything is possible. If the Son of God could rise above anger and hatred, if he could find a way to forgive his enemies, then guess what? So can we. How many of us 
have gotten into trouble because we gave in to our anger. I wonder how many of us have said things in a moment of stress that we later regretted. I wonder how many marriages have been broken, how many friendships have ended, how many jobs have been lost because we have lost our temper and said and done things that we later regret. Is there a better way? How do we handle our anger so it doesn't destroy us and it doesn't destroy others? Well, there are several things we can do. Probably the first and foremost thing is we need the courage to face our anger. Courage. It takes courage to be a Christian. It's not a fair weather faith. Some people say, I just accept Jesus. Jesus doesn't need your acceptance. He wants you to follow him. He says either get in or get out. Follow me or turn from me. And until we can admit the other face, the two face, that no one ever sees, you know what, we're never going to get better. You can come to me for 30 years of counseling, you'll never get better unless you face it. Unless you face it, you'll never get better. So many of us have a public face that looks good, looks good in a private face that we keep locked behind stone walls, a face of, of anger and hatred, but make no mistake about it, it's crouching at your door and it desires to have you. Always has since the beginning. So you got to deal with it. You got to face it. Secondly, share your struggles with someone. As the evidence started to come out, it seems like many of, of O.J. Simpson's friends knew that he had a strong temper. They knew that he was prone to violent behavior, but no one confronted him. No one confronted him with the ugly truth. Did no one care enough? What what if he said, I need some help? Would anyone come to his help? What if he said, I've got some anger in me and I'm not handling it very well? This thing with Nicole is driving me nuts. I want to hurt somebody. Would things have turned out differently if he said that or someone had asked them? Would that have changed these things? Men especially struggle in this area. So men, listen up. If you fall asleep, wake up. We harbor these feelings and we don't know what to do with them. What's worse, we're afraid to tell anyone because we think that sharing our struggles is a sign of weakness. It's not weakness, it's stupidity. By not sharing, you're not being brave, you're being an idiot. How wrong we are. The weak cover up while the strong have the courage to admit, I've got a problem here. And I need to make it right. We wouldn't think twice about getting our car fixed if we heard a bang in the engine. If we had a leak in our roof, we'd be on that like Johnny on spot. But we have a problem in our life and we just turn it away. So men, it's time to step up to the plate. Number three, do a relationship inventory. Base it on scripture, passage we looked at, Ephesians 4, 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Mm, If we would just grab onto that, not grieve the Holy Spirit, our whole life would change. Sometimes I think we just don't care if we grieve the Holy Spirit. We're just going to do what we did all the way along. and We stand before the Lord and he says, you grieve me. Yeah, I know. Can I get into heaven? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And these words are incredibly specific. They're incredibly specific. 
So check your life for any, any signs of bitterness, any signs of anger and rage and slander and brawling and malice. If you find even a trace of those things, get rid of them. Get rid of them. They're like a virus in your bloodstream. And anger can kill. So can bitterness and slander and rage and resentment. It doesn't just kill other people. It also kills you. On the inside, it's like a slow, slow growing cancer. Number four, yield control of your life to the Holy Spirit. You can have the Holy Spirit in control or anger can take control. There is no third option. There is no middle ground. Jesus has shown us the way. You don't have to live in anger and bitterness over the way people treat you. And though the power of the Holy Spirit in your life is there, it may not be making a difference in your life. God's Spirit can set you free from the chains that bind you to your past. And the price is simple, but the price is not cheap. And you've got to give up your anger. You've got to let go of your bitterness and say farewell to those hurtful memories. And then and only then will the Holy Spirit be free to take control of your life. So the question I have for you today is where are you today? Where are you today? These things in your life, they're not going to go away. They're just going to set up stronger in the concrete of your soul. If you're ready to deal with this, then I'd like to pray for you this morning. And I'd like you to join me with this and start the process, continue the process, or revisit the process. But do something today. Don't just come to church. Do something today at the altar of God. Deal with it. Let's pray. Father, for too long I have tried to solve my own problems. I thought I could handle things on my own, and it hasn't worked. I've made a mess of things. I've tried and tried, and I'm tired of trying. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking away the penalty of my sin when you died on the cross. Thank you for showing me how to live. I now submit my anger and my rage and my bitterness to you. Set me free from its power over my life. Thank you for showing me how to forgive people who have hurt me the most. Holy Spirit, here and now, I yield control to you. And from this day forward, I want you to run my life and to be in control. So please, Lord, fill you, me with your power so that I may be transformed truly be a different person. You're in charge now, Lord. Lead me on, and I will follow you from this day forward. 